Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, latest staff and physician town hall. My name is Kaylin Pettit. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing here at HHS, and I'm filling in today for our trusty host, uh, Aaron Levo, who is away this week. I'm really pleased to be here and to have uh, all of you tuning in again. Um, so we've got uh, a few topics to cover today. As usual, we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers as well as celebration. So please have uh, your hand ready to be raised when the time comes uh, to share or to ask a question of our leaders. Today we have uh, with us uh, Rob McIsaac, who will kick us off in just a moment. We have Dr. Dominic Mertz, Kelly Campbell, Michelle LaRue, and many other members of our executive team on hand to, uh, to answer your questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob to get us started. Thanks very much, Kaylin. Um, and thanks all for tuning into uh, this week's town hall. Um, we've got a couple of topics to cover today, but uh, we're hoping to save most of our time for uh, questions and answers. Um, as always, I'd like to start by acknowledging the important work that uh, each of you uh, is doing to continue uh, to keep our hospitals safe. I think it's extraordinary and worth noting that since Tuesday, we've had um, zero uh, COVID-19 patients in our care. This success, I think, is largely attributable to the collective effort uh, in our community in minimizing the spread of the virus, but each of you has made significant contributions to that collective effort, and I think in many ways uh, you've uh, led our community's response to the pandemic. So as we continue to navigate the challenges that uh, COVID has placed in front of us, I think uh, you, I thank you for um, your ongoing commitment to our hospital and to our community. I'd like to take a moment to provide an update about uh, pandemic pay. Um, as you know, Ontario hospitals have been working with uh, the provincial govern government for some time to receive and disperse pandemic pay funds to eligible employees. Uh, initially, the government had indicated that the funds would begin to flow to hospitals the week of June 15th uh, in payment installments. In fact, uh, we received our initial installment only yesterday, uh, and despite now having received funding, there continue to be outstanding details we require from the government to uh, guide our payout. We want to get these funds to eligible staff as quickly as possible, but we also need to make sure that we get this right. Uh, we are hopeful that we will begin to issue funds to HHS employees uh, in mid-August. Um, I know this has been long awaited and I appreciate uh, your patience very much. Um, and just uh, would also point out that, you know, um, we continue um, to advocate to the government um, for a, a more broad-minded view about eligibility for these funds. Hopefully you've seen um, uh, some of our more public efforts. We've written a letter, an open letter to the government. We uh, published uh, an op-ed in The Spectator uh, relatively recently. And those efforts really began very early on in the process uh, where uh, we were advocating uh, at various tables uh, for a uh, more equitable approach to pandemic pay. Uh, but it is what it is, and we are where we are. So I'd like to turn it over now to a couple of my colleagues for some additional updates, starting with an infection control update from uh, Dr. Mertz. We'll pause after Dr. Mertz's presentation for a brief Q&A. Uh, I know he needs to get off to another meeting. From there, uh, we'll go to Kelly Campbell uh, for an update on uh, the self-screening process, uh, and then to Michelle LaRue about asymptomatic testing. Uh, at that point, we'll open it up for q and I know many of you have submitted questions in advance, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, and finally, as always, we'll wrap up with uh, some celebrations. So hopefully, as this proceeds, you can be thinking about 
uh, some people uh, or things you'd like to celebrate. So having said all of that, uh, Dr. Mertz, uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I was tasked today uh, on summarizing the epidemiology to give you an idea where we are currently at in this pandemic, and then also talk about um, interpretation of test results for COVID-19. So let's start off with the epidemiology. In front of you, you see obviously a map of Canada showing you the total number of cases of COVID-19 to date. So we are just above 100,000 by now. Most cases in Quebec, 56,000. So more than half, followed by uh, Ontario with 36,000. Below that, you can see the epi curve, which peaked uh, end of April, beginning of May, and is on a steady decline since. When you're looking at what's currently happening, uh, the three provinces with the highest rates, so Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta, have roughly the same number of new cases per day per 100,000 population. So we are in a very similar boat. Uh, next slide, please. This is Ontario, and again, you see um, an epi curve here. The epi curve in, in Ontario peaked mid April. Uh, color coded here, you can see the type of transmission, and you see a lot of blue here, and blue means um, transmission from close contacts and outbreaks. Clo close contacts typically being household settings. Uh, the more concerning cases are the brown ones and the green ones where there's no known epilink, which suggests that there's a source in the community that hasn't been identified. And you can see even here mid-June, you still have a significant proportion, uh, roughly one third um, of those cases. Uh, the bars at the very right hand side since June 24 are black for now, which means that new cases can still be added. This figure here shows you the cases by um, date of onset of symptoms, so it can still populate uh, several days back. Uh, next slide. When you're looking at Hamilton, and Hamilton, the way public health presents the data here is the a cumulative number of cases, so you don't see number of new cases per day, but instead you can look at uh, how, the, um, how steep the increase is, which gives you an idea of how many new cases on average you have per day. Uh, I remember saying back in May that it's probably not going to get any better than where we had been. That's the first yellow box here. We were hovering around three to maybe five cases, new cases per day. Uh, then the Roslin happened and we saw over several weeks a larger number of cases. And then I would say we are in the same equilibrium that we had been beginning of May with, again, somewhere between zero, five, occasionally more cases per day on average, but pretty stable on a low burn. Uh, next slide. So let's switch gears here and talk about testing. This is again from Public Health Ontario. You see the blue bars which show you how many tests were completed per day and the purple line which shows you the percent of the tests being positive. When you go back here to mid-April, you will see that we've done roughly 8,000 tests per day and eight eight-ish percent were positive. That was our peak in terms of positivity. Then the number of tests increased, the percentage positive decreased. We had another bump here in May, um, mid-May, where it increased again up to 8%. And ever since, it's decreasing, and we are now clearly below 1%, pretty much consistently over the last couple of weeks with much higher numbers of tests, typically between 20 and 25,000 per day. This being said, many of those tests are in asymptomatic individuals, which um, result in positives in typically less than 1% uh, uh, or even less than 0.1%, uh, which certainly drives down your overall percentage positives. 
Uh, next slide. So I, I would like to um, provide some clarification of what a positive and a negative test in an asymptomatic individual means, in particular given that I believe it's Susan today talking later about the, uh, the more streamlined and healthcare worker-friendly approach that we can provide for those healthcare workers who seek for asymptomatic testing. But I want to make sure that if you decide you want to get tested, that you understand what the test result means. So let's start off with the positives. Assuming you're asymptomatic, then you can be pre-symptomatic if you test positive. Pre-symptomatic means that you will develop signs of infection shortly, typically within a max of two, maybe up to four days. That's the range that the test may be able, able to pick up. Uh, you can as well have, and that's the second option here, an asymptomatic infection, and you may or may not be infectious at, at the current point of time. We've learned over time that people are typically symptomatic seven to eight days, maybe up to nine, ten, after they become symptomatic. So from onset of symptoms, probably the same range applies for truly asymptomatic people that they are infectious for 10 days, but your NPS test can remain positive for weeks to months thereafter, which brings us to the third category. You may have had a COVID infection the last week, so up to a couple of months, you're still positive, doesn't mean that you're infectious at all. And then very important, if you get tested in a low prevalence setting as we are currently in, um, you may have a false positive test. We estimate that among 1,000 tests, there's one false positive. If you have a negative test, it basically means you currently do not have an infection or you may have an infection, but you have a false negative result, which probably results in five in 100 to worst case scenario, 10 per 100 tests. It does not mean, and I would like to emphasize this here, it does not mean that you're not incubating the infection. And we've seen this with outbreak investigations. We, we may have tested the healthcare worker today. They become symptomatic two, three days later. It's not a test to identify whether you're carrying the virus in you. It hasn't started to replicate yet and it may make you sick in a few days. And that's why testing is not a replacement for self-isolation. If you had a significant exposure, you're isolated for 14 days, even if you repeatedly test negative, because it cannot rule out that you're incubating the infection. Next slide. Now, all of this summarized, um, if you're in the first category, pre-symptomatic, you're infectious without knowing it. If you are asymptomatic, uh, uh, you may or may not be infectious. That's the small arrow here. If you have a false negative result, you're infectious, but nobody would know. Um, on the other hand, and on the next slide, I want just to clarify what the implications are of testing. If you have a positive test and you're in any of those four categories, this will result in 14 days of self-isolation because we don't have a test that would allow us to see whether you're currently infectious or not. Um, with false positives, there's a workaround by repeating the test. And what I hear from public health is, in many instances, when they do healthcare worker testing in long-term care facilities, they have the odd one positive, then they retest that individual the next day and the test comes back negative, suggesting that it was a false positive. I think I stop here and happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Dominic. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, if you have a question for Dominic, please raise your hand. You can also type the question in the chat box. So I think we do have one uh, raised hand here. So this username is IKAK. I'll unmute you there. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Hi. Uh, hi, this is Dr. Cock from uh, Pathology. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, so if the negative does not completely rule out the infection, why not just test um, symptomatic people or high-risk settings such as long-term care? Um, so in other words, what is the point of testing asymptomatic people if you can't completely say definitively 
um, that you know you're totally negative? I think the short answer to that is it's the current provincial guidance to do so. Sorry, it's the what guidance? The provincial guidance oh, currently okay. to do so, and that's why we are doing it, and that's also as to why we are providing this option to our healthcare workers. Okay, thank you for that question. I'll just go to the chat now. Um, uh, so from Tammy Packer, she's asking, isn't this also to enable contact tracing? Is that correct, Dominic? Uh, certainly, if you are a true positive and you have a active infection at this point of time, uh, this would result in contact tracing for sure. Um, again, in the current prevalence situation, your pretest probability, so the probability that you're positive in the absence of an exposure and in the absence of infections is so low that the risk of false positives are very high. If you have a true positive, yes, it would result in contact tracing um, as it would in a symptomatic patient who tests positive. Okay, and well, we've got one uh, one last question here for you, Dominic. Um, oh, sorry, two more. One just came in. So the first is in the chart that you showed. Please explain how the number of positives uh, is higher without testing. I'm not entirely sure what what the question means here. So. Um, what you need to keep in mind when I talk about the percentage positivity is if you have the same number of cases out there positive on a given day, but you increase your testing by throwing in a lot of asymptomatic testing, you will still see the same number of cases you identify, but your percentage positive will get lower and lower and lower because the number of tests increases. And the opposite can happen and the one, the one peak that you saw in this figure, maybe the question is related to that. Um, oh, I see, positive is higher than number tested. There's different scales. So the one scale was for number of tests and the other scale was the percentage. So uh, that's why the purple line was higher than the number tested. So that's the, the purple line was the positivity and not the number of positive tests. I hope that clarifies how to understand that figure. Thanks, Dominic. Um, so I think you may have answered this, but just one last question related to this from Tim Zahavich. Is the rate of positive test results related to the number of tests being performed? Yeah, I think that's what I just tried to explain, right? The more tests you do in people who have a low pretest probability, um, the lower will be your percentage positive. Great, thank you, Dominic. I know you've got to go, so thanks so much for being with us this morning. Um, so uh, as we all know, we've recently launched a new self-screening process for staff and physicians, and uh, I'd like at this point to turn it over to Kelly Campbell to provide us with an update on that new process and uh, how it impacts those working at an HHS site. Kelly, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Kaylin. Um, so we didn't actually launch a new self-screening tool. We've had that in place for several weeks now and staff uh, have been using that tool and we've been monitored, monitoring that, staff and physicians. What we've changed is the process when you come in uh, the staff entrance at our sites. Uh, a week ago, we communicated that we would um, start to transition over the course of this week and effective today, we would no longer staff staff entrances with screeners. Um, our McMaster site actually blazed the trail for us, and uh, we did a pilot at that site starting uh, in about the third week in June, uh, where we stopped screening at the door. And so we got a little bit of experience before we rolled it out to the rest of the sites uh, as of today. So there's really three different scenarios. Um, we were hoping that over the course of this past week, we could start to educate and people would catch on to the change. But we also know that um, some people are away on vacation, some may have not been here for the course of time uh, to learn that there's a change and so what do they do? 
So there's really three different scenarios um, of staff physicians as they present. So the first is um, if you're using the online screening tool and you've done that before you come to work, which is when you should do that, you have a green dot and you're cleared to, return, to um, come into work and you have a clean mask, then you can don that before entering the hospital. You do not have to stop at a screening booth. You can come straight into the staff entrances, the majority of which are badge access now at our sites, uh, and you just go right to your unit. So that's the, the best case scenario, and, and we hope everybody gets there very quickly over the next few days. So you've done your screening, you have a proceed to work, green dot, and you have a clean mask. If you have a clean mask, but you don't use the online screening tool for some reason, then you can don your mask, enter the hospital, and as soon as you get to your unit, use a computer to complete your online screening tool. And if you need assistance with that, certainly I know supervisors, charge nurses, leaders would be happy to help you. Um, the third scenario is I've done my online screening. I have my green dot. I'm good to proceed to work, but I've been away. I didn't know there was a change or I forgot to bring a clean mask home last night. So you cannot enter the hospital without a mask on. Uh, so we ask that in that case, you go to the patient and visitor entrance uh, and you obtain a mask at that point. And you can obviously show that you have a green dot and you're cleared to return to work. Um, at many of the sites, they've dedicated particular entrances for staff to do that. Um, and that will be site specific. So those are really the three scenarios. We're hoping again that everyone quickly gets to using the online tool and getting in the habit of taking home a clean mask each night. Um, these can be picked up at your unit, um, put into a paper bag. All of the units have been stocked and program areas that don't normally have a logistics cart um, have also been stocked with masks and paper bags. If you're a physician or a learner or a resident, you can just pick up a mask and a bag from the, any unit during the day that you're on so that you have it with you. Um, in addition, because we need to make sure that staff are continuing to use the online screening tool, obviously it's important that we know and that you know that you're healthy to come to work, um, leaders will be randomly checking. So though we're not checking at the door anymore for um, your, the results of your screening tool, Leaders may ask you during the course of the day, they may ask you at huddle, uh, they may ask you um, if they're not on site with you to forward your email that you receive saying that you're cleared to go to work. Uh, and leaders are asked to complete a CQI tool every day to let us know that they are auditing and we are uh, monitoring that information. So the change is not about stopping the screening process, it's really about facilitating staff coming quickly into the hospital. They, you know, we've been at this for a while. And uh, as long as you have picked up your clean mask the night before, you can just come in as you did pre-COVID into a staff entrance. Um, so happy to entertain any questions at this point. Thanks very much, Kelly. So we're going to hold on questions, get through um, the next presentation. At that point, we'll open it up for Q&A. But I do see a few questions coming through related to, to online screening. So uh, please be patient with us for a moment. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle LaRue, our VP of HR, to chat about online, or sorry, on-site testing for asymptomatic staff and physicians. Michelle, over to you. Thanks, Kaylin. So uh, just a reminder to everybody, communications have gone out previously, but uh, you go on to our employee health site and you are able to book appointments online. Uh, we have on-site testing at three of our hospitals, at Muncie, at the General, and at the Jurovinsky. Uh, at West Lincoln, we ask you to schedule and the information is on the slide of how you can do that. We're working to also get, of course, on-site testing at our St. Peter's location, so stay tuned, more to come on that. It, we just are quickly doing our best to roll this out to staff. And in the interim, of course, our St. Peter's Hospital staff are uh, able to, uh, through the information again on the slide, uh, go to the West End Clinic. So again, this is about ease of access for our staff and physicians who are asymptomatic and do wish to be tested, which Dominic spoke to much more eloquently than I could earlier. Uh, and with that, Kaylin, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Great, short and sweet. Thanks, Michelle. So at this point, we'll open it up to questions. As a reminder, you can use the raise your hand function. Um, you can uh, also use the chat or Q&A functions. And if you prefer to ask your question offline, you can send it to hhsnews at hhsc.ca and we'll either uh, answer it at an upcoming webinar uh, directly via email or we'll post an answer on the hub for you. Um, so just going back to Kelly, your presentation about self-screening, we do have a, a few questions that came through. Um, so the first question is, what is the compliance rate uh, so far for the online screening tool? Yeah, so I don't know if Susan Fucciarelli has joined. Employee Health Services monitors that information. Um, so I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, one of the things that... Um, makes that a little more difficult to answer is that only staff that are coming on site are required to screen. If you're working remotely, you don't have to screen. So it's not like we could just say, here's our total staff complement and, and do a percentage from that. Um, so unless uh, Susan can respond, I don't have, we'd have to follow up with an answer on that one. I believe Susan is with us. Susan, are you there? I am. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're not looking at this from a percentage Endpoint, but we are monitoring the numbers. So on the back end, everybody that completes the tool gets fed into a database that we monitor on a daily basis. And so, uh, as Kelly said, we, we started this out with a trial at the Muncie site. And so we monitored those numbers over the course of that, uh, that week and into the second week just to see whether or not we were seeing any kind of a significant drop. We'll continue to do that across all of the sites. And if we are seeing drops in the completion of the tool, then we'll be able to follow up with those uh, specific areas. Um, that's one of the other reasons for the audit tool or the, the compliance tool, if you will, um, so that we can do those random spot checks so that we're, we don't see a decline. We also have to take into consideration that we are getting into vacation time now as well. So of course we saw a drop, for example, on uh, July the 1st and into um, the second and third because that was the Thursday, Friday, lots of vacations happening. So we're, we're taking all of those things into account. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, another question related to screening um, and specifically accessibility at entrances. Kelly, are staff allowed to use visitor exits moving forward? Yeah, so that's very site specific, uh, Kaylin, and so I would suggest that staff follow up um, at their site. Um, some sites, um, just based on the configuration, are allowing that, others are not. So I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but certainly the site administrator's office would be able to provide that information. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, a question, uh, so related to, to mask wearing, and perhaps Kirsten Krall, I can punt this one to you. Um, is it, oh, sorry, just lost my spot here. Are clean personal fabric masks accept, acceptable for use, um, especially when a person is working in a non-patient area? Can you clarify our current policy on that? Mm -hmm. I'll start and then uh, Susan may need to jump in as well. But right now, um, across our organization, we want people to use the masks that are issued by the hospital. Um, they are rated masks. Uh, it sets a certain standard for everybody. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that a patient uh, is infected. It could be a colleague, right? So we're making sure that people have masks that give a certain level of standard um, uh, protection. Um, and that way, uh, we're all doing the same thing. Um, and people also continue to have access to fresh, clean uh, materials as well. So um, Susan, anything further that you want to add about the um, actual masks that people are wearing? No, you've covered it all, Kirsten, for the, the hospital sites. Thanks. So we have a couple questions related to um, the, the screening process. Um, and, and both are wondering if there's a way to automate the, the screening audit process um, so that leaders automatically have access to uh, information about staff screening. Is there um, anything in the works uh, at this point? Susan, are you able to respond? So, yeah, so we are working on that. We're looking at a, a process whereby we can automate and dovetail the information from the screening tool with um, the, the staff sign in for the day. So I, whether it be through the Kronos tool or another tool, um, but that's going to take some effort to do that. 
so we are working toward that as an automated solution. Um, but in the interim, we, we do request that the, the leaders of the areas uh, complete the CQI tool. Great, thank you. So switching gears for a moment, I'd like to go back to pandemic pay, which Rob provided an update on uh, earlier in our agenda. Um, so we do have an advance uh, question that came through the email hotline. Um, and I'd like to uh, maybe put it to Dave McKaig, who's uh, uh, on the line with us this morning. The question is, um, why HHS or whether HHS addressed uh, early in April when we first learned of the government's pandemic pay uh, program, um, the inclusion or uh, rather the um, lack of inclusion of some staff, uh, particularly those who work face to face with patients to obtain pandemic pay. Um, Dave, can you provide maybe an update on some of the advocacy efforts that we've been um, undertaking in support of, of uh, staff eligibility? Um, sure, happy to just do a quick sound check. You can hear me okay, Kayla, and I was having trouble with my phone earlier. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So um, yeah, when pandemic pay uh, became a thing and was first announced by the government, uh, certainly a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty, information was changing quite rapidly and uh, uh, you know, a lot of questions being asked by hospitals as well. Um, what I can certainly uh, confirm for you is that advocacy efforts started long before uh, you may have even seen or heard of them. And our position as an organization has always been and continues to be that all hospital workers uh, deserve to receive pandemic pay and recognition of uh, the, the efforts, the, the, the extreme levels of work and care that have been given, both by uh, staff that are patient facing and those that uh, may not even be patient facing, but certainly uh, that is our position that all hospital workers have always been deserving of pandemic pay. We continue to push that agenda and that message to government uh, thus far. And as Rob had said, it has not been a great experience for uh, for the sector um, on this particular issue. Thus far, uh, the definitions as they have been posted have not been modified in, uh, I believe, probably two to three weeks now. So um, we're continuing to press the message, but uh, again, just a, a thank you to everybody and confirmation that all uh, should be included from our perspective, and that has always been our message. Thanks for clarifying that, Dave. Um, so, uh, switching gears again, back to uh, the topic of PPE and, and masking, we do have a couple questions um, coming through different forums around uh, compliance with PPE and mask use, both in terms of staff physician compliance and also uh, patient and visitor compliance. Um, Kirsten, perhaps you're able to speak to um, or shed some light on what an employer physician should do if they um, observe a colleague who is not uh, complying with current PPE policy. And then um, as well, uh, how are we handling um, any patients who arrive uh, to us who are not willing to wear a mask? Yeah, so I know sometimes this can be awkward for people, but it is important for all of us to do our part as, as part of our society and taking this serious. It is a serious disease. Um, so approaching people, again, if it's a friend, it's a lot easier uh, sometimes to just remind people um, it's important that you wear your mask, um, you know, and not wear it at your chin where you uh, end up contaminating yourself or, or storing it in a way that uh, just spreads a potential um, um, material from the outside of the mask elsewhere on your body. Um, so it is important that people uh, follow the standard and again, um, you know, kindly remind people we're all role modeling to others um, around how to wear a mask um, and that in fact, you know, this is a good thing for us. I get in the summertime it can be uh, quite hot, uh, but also equally important uh, with your mask is that physical distancing. You know, there are things that you can find online that people are trying to suggest might actually uh, spur people to think about um, just a correction, uh, to do it very kindly, to say, um, you know, even sometimes a physical uh, gesture um, as, as an example, you know, kind of bringing more distance between yourself and the individual who's not wearing the mask um, is, is sometimes enough for people to realize, ah, I forgot, uh, I haven't got my mask on properly. Um, 
maybe there's a code word uh, we could even generate in the organization that might be a little bit of fun uh, but also um, would be a good reminder for people i think for the most part people are very good at wearing their mask it's when they go on breaks um, and if they're on our campuses and so on and don't realize that perhaps they've lost that physical distancing so it's it is important that people take note um, that to actually do say something but it's not there to pick a fight and certainly you're not going to take on uh, conflicts um, it's 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 something that if you're worried about and uh, it's not going to be received well, certainly um, you have ways of approaching supervisors to bring it to their attention. Um, the other way to think about this is maybe if there is a team where you're kind of noticing it more often is maybe to bring it to their team huddles, um, just to kind of say we have a problem that you know we're often uh, not following the practices and what can we do as a team to try and get this corrected. It just kind of calls it out and takes us as some team ownership. Um, and you know, we have had Ministry of Labour on our premises many times um, as people have uh, raised questions or we've had uh, issues that need follow up um, and they observe some of these issues as well. I, I just remind people by law, um, as an employer, we're doing our part to make sure that people understand these are expectations and that um, we've trained people and have given them the means to do the right thing. But if people really choose not to do it, they are also um, prone to be fined. There are financial fines that Ministry of Labour could actually issue on people. Um, not that we ever want to go there, but um, certainly that, that is a means as well. So in other words, people are expected to take this seriously, especially our employees individuals who are on our premises um, who have been given permission to come on. As far as visitors, um, you know, again, we expect all visitors to follow suit. As far as patients, again, encouraging them. Uh, our ambulatory patients, of course, are expected to, to wear masks. There will be the occasional individual who has real um, dilemmas as far as wearing a mask safely just because of respiratory illness and so on. I think the screeners are doing a good job to try and understand, okay, what other means do we have to try and coach this person and to perhaps uh, connect with the team where they're going uh, to give them the heads up and maybe they need to segregate them a little bit differently. Um, so hopefully I've, I've tried to give you a few ideas uh, that you can work with. Thanks. Thanks, Kirsten. Do you have one more question for you related to masking? Um, so this uh, individual is asking, um, uh, so Prior to uh, universal masking started, staff were wearing level two masks for patient facing roles. And now all staff are wearing level one masks, including uh, for droplet precautions. Can you um, provide some rationale behind this and speak to uh, the safety in, in using level one masks? Yeah, so level one masks are medical quality masks. Um, they, and the, the level differences become into the degree of filtration to a very limited extent um, between level one and, and two and three, even for that matter. But what becomes very different between the masks um, is the level of fluid resistance um, that they're able to sustain. So if you were in a very, um, in, a, in a vascular um, area where there's a potential for a lot of spray or something that's going on as far as an interaction with patient, you want a higher uh, fluid resistance. Just again, that pressure and how much fluid is actually able to infiltrate into the mask. That's really where it becomes more, more of an issue. Uh, so a level one mask for pretty well most of our interactions is fine on our COVID unit. Uh, particularly, we have continued to have a, a level two available to them. Um, and level threes typically are not widely used across, across the organization for, for too many things. Um, they're in a pretty tight supply anyways, but uh, in chemo areas, again, where, where preparation and so on um, and risk of spray is, is uh, much greater. That's where our level threes are coming into play as well. Anyway, so for the most part, level one is, is good for most of the interactions that we're having right across the organization with our patients and our day-to-day -day work. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, so I see that Marlene Huggins has raised her hand. Marlene, would you like to go ahead with your question? Sorry, I think I might have hit that by mistake. Oh, no worries. It happens. Okay, so why don't we take one more question um, uh, from our chat here. Just let me see what we've got. So there is a question, and Susan, maybe I can I can go back to you um, around the uh, citywide turnaround time for COVID testing. It seems that there have been some delays in recent days and weeks. What is the expected wait time for COVID results for staff who are being tested uh, at HHS? 
thank you. So yeah, we deal directly with the, the labs, the HRLMP labs. So we have a 24 hour turnaround time. If um, the volumes increase to such an extent that that changes, we would notify staff, but we have consistently had a 24 hour turnaround time over the last several weeks. Great, thank you, Susan. Um, so I think in the interest of time and to make sure that we've got some good time left to cover off celebrations, uh, I'll turn it back to, to Rob to, uh, to kick off our, our final agenda item. Um, thank you all so much for all of your questions. Again, any questions that weren't answered live today will be answered uh, either directly if you send them to the HHS News inbox um, or uh, on the hub. We've been keeping a running list of, of uh, town hall questions with response on the hub. Um, so Rob, I will uh, turn it over to you to kick off our celebrations. Okay, yeah, thanks, uh, Kaylin. I, I would turn my camera on, but I can't um, for some reason. So anyway, thanks. Um, oh, there we go. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, all the good questions uh, and for engaging. Um, much appreciated. Um, as usual, we'll move on to uh, celebrations and maybe I'll kick it off. Um, I'll start with a shout out to our NRT, the Nursing Resource Team. Um, the, that team identified an improvement opportunity to replace paper generating processes with a digital solution. And so since the fall, uh, you know, we've saved about 10,000 sheets of paper. Um, have fewer errors uh, and obviously you know had to buy less paper so anyway I just it you can read more about that in the team story uh, on the hub I just think it's a great example of CQI uh, in action so um, if there are others who have celebrations please uh, use the raise a hand feature uh, you can also type uh, your shout out uh, in the chat function and we'll we'll call it out so uh, Kayla, maybe you can uh, moderate this, the balance of this session. Yeah, so ideally, uh, we'd love to hear your, your celebrations out loud. So please raise your hand if you'd like to give a shout out to someone or a team at HHS. I'll give folks a minute to do that. We're quiet today. What about our fellow leaders uh, on the call? Do, do any of you have, have a celebration to call out today? Kaylin, it's Dave. Um, sure, I could call out just, you know, I see a lot of information that flows um, up to the province uh, around managing all of these situations. And I just wanna call out HHS. I mean, the work that we do, is very good and it's known to be very good and we have that reputation so we should all feel proud about the response but also how we contribute to you know the, the overall planning and response uh, in the province so uh, so great work like i've seen some fantastic work that's great agreed thanks dave so kaylin it's less yeah, yeah. um so um, people uh, may or may not be aware, but the province had new guidelines for us around uh, management of asymptomatic testing of patients going for procedural um, care, and then out of that uh, risk stratification and some directions around revised guidelines for PPE. And I think on behalf of Dr. Kelly and myself and Dr. O'Leary, um, what we've seen, we we've started a slow implementation of those guidelines officially last week, and we're hearing really positive feedback that teams are em embracing the new guidelines. They're based on us having a very low epidemiology of COVID, but really um, very positive teamwork and real commitment from anesthesiologists and surgeons and our frontline teams to really align our practices and do the right thing for ourselves and our patients. So big thank you for, um, it was a change and it was one more change for the team to adapt to. So sincere thanks. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, Patty McEwen, I see that you have your hand up. Uh, please go ahead. 
Hi, uh, I just wanted to um, shout out or celebrate the screeners that have um, been screening since the beginning of the pandemic response and many of them are returning to their home departments and their roles and I, I don't think anyone can accurately express or not accurately but can really say how much um, we appreciate everything those individuals did and um, we're very uh, thankful and glad that they get to go back to their uh, jobs now and I'm sure that they are as well, but the the impact they have had on the organization and on just keeping everyone sa safe has been incredible. And I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of everyone at HHS. Very much agreed. Thank you, Patty. Um, we do have a shout out in the chat from Kim Kemp. She'd like to uh, celebrate Julie Hoflack, who's been doing uh, uh, work for corporate services and her role as CSS trainer. She supports EAs, porters, and nutrition services. So congratulations, Julie. Um, also from uh, Susan O'Leary, uh, she says, thanks Leslie for all your work on PPE. Um, I see us heading in the right direction with adoption of the new guidelines. Cheers. Um, Alison Fox Robichaux, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead. Thanks, Kaylin. I'd like to shout out to all of the clinical educators. They have taken the PPE guidelines that have been a moving target and gone with the flow and re-educated. They have re-educated the new residents coming into the system. Um, they've done an outstanding job in a challenge with multiple questions and changing targets, and I really want to celebrate all of those educators. Thanks, Allison. Uh, Bruce Squires, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Thanks very much, Kaylin. Uh, and first of all, ditto to all of the celebrations that have already been shared. And maybe I'll, I'll just share a piece of information that to me suggests why, uh, why everyone should, uh, should, should celebrate uh, their own activities and that those are their colleagues. Um, since the time of, uh, of the, the, the pandemic and the ramp down of services, We've seen more than a thousand percent increase um, in our use of virtual care. We're up over 80,000 visits. And so um, that's really a reflection of the, the, the efforts of folks across the organization and has been so important to maintaining the health of the community. So I think that's, a, that's kind of a celebration um, uh, on, on everyone. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Kelly, you've got your hand up. Do you have a celebration? Yes, yeah, so I was just going to add to Patty McEwen's comments, thanking the redeployed staff who have been screening. But I also want to thank the leaders that very quickly stood up the screening process. When we think back to March and April, uh, to Deb Bedini uh, as a director taking that on um, in addition to her daily role. And then um, most importantly, Josh Daker. Uh, Josh came out of his regular duties at Ron Joyce and has been managing so effectively, uh, working with 35 different managers for all these redeployed staff and trying to get schedules together, manning both staff and patient and visitor screening across five sites, uh, as well as our West End Clinic. So it's been a significant challenge, and Josh has done an amazing job. Uh, of course, supported by um, the Central Scheduling Office, Brad Elms, our HR team, uh, as well as the facilities group that pulled together the screening booths uh, over a weekend uh, in many cases. So it was just a really significant team effort uh, that obviously continues today, but I just wanted to shout out to that group for their tremendous support. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kelly, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Kaylin. So, uh, just to follow up on what uh, Les Gautier said, just I'd also like to um, I'd also like to uh, uh, shout out to the to the whole periop team, and in fact, the teams across all the all the hospital settings with the ramp up we've been doing. We're now in second week of phase two ramp up, and uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, issues have been dealt with uh, very very well, and uh, we're actually now beginning 
being able to provide the care, surgical care to our, uh, our patients that they need. So again, I'd really shout that out because it's been a, a wonderful uh, performance by the whole team across all of the sites uh, to allow our patients to get the uh, procedural and surgical care that they need. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten, I saw your hand up. Did you have another celebration? Oh, no, you've lowered it. Okay. Uh, I can jump in. Thank you. I thought you had yeah. enough. <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to say thanks to our, our, our staff on the units and so on who have been managing our visitors. Um, you know, we've got a, a policy that uh, has loosened some of these restrictions, but I know it has uh, been uh, with mixed messages received by some people trying to interpret this and our staff really have gone uh, the, the extra mile to really try and support our patients and still try and stay true to this policy. Um, so thank you for advocating for our patients um, and our families um, who we do know are partners and care with us. Um, hopefully over time we'll continue to monitor for sure, uh, but see if we can relax some of this down the road. Um, but I know um, even just getting lists uh, down to our screeners every day is a, is a big feat. Um, so thank you for all of that work that everybody's doing. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, so we've got just a couple more celebrations before we wrap up. Um, Karen Finley, would you like to go ahead? Can you hear me? We can. Yes, I just want to say I think it's been um, an exercise and fantastic collaboration from everybody. And I'm talking about across medical specialties, but also across interprofessional groups and allied health groups. And I, I don't see any reason why this won't continue. So one of the really strong points leading out of this is our collaboration uh, and, and taking us out of our own silos and working together. And I think it's, it's very promising for the future. Thank you, Dr. Finley. Um, okay, and just one final uh, uh, shout out in our, our chat here from Judy Baxter. Uh, she'd like to call out uh, some great examples of CQI work this week. Um, she says the abilities team did some uh, excellent job process mapping, um, per mapping permanent accommodation process to develop standard work. Uh, and to F5 at Jurovinsky, their CQI scorecard is really coming together. So congratulations to both of those teams. If you do have a shout out um, that we didn't get to today, please send it to hhsnews at hhsc.ca. We'll be sure to post it to the hub. We've comp been compiling all of our celebrations uh, there. So thanks everyone for uh, making time to celebrate one another. Uh, with that, Rob, I'll turn it back to you to uh, close us out. Thanks, Kaylin. I'll just add my voice and to saying thanks everybody for those shout outs. You know, to, really doesn't cost anything to do that. And I think it, it really uh, has a lot of value nonetheless uh, for us to recognize, um, you know, healthcare is a team sport and, and to recognize uh, the contributions of the other team members. So uh, thanks for doing that. Thanks to everybody for tuning in to today's town hall. Uh, just as a reminder, if you didn't get to your question, uh, please send it to HHS News at uh, hhsd.ca and we'll post it uh, to the hub. Our next town hall is scheduled for July 23rd, so uh, don't forget you can always submit your questions uh, in advance and also to HHS News. So thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of the week. Cheers.